good evening. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I think we'll start tonight by playing this video and see if it works for you. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So tonight is really a night about understanding a movement and being part of movement, part of a big movement. My name's John Martin, and I'm the CEO of the Southeastern Institute of Research. And for the last several months, I've been working with Fest Events, the City of Norfolk, and the Downtown Norfolk Council to look at Norfolk in a different way and to think about the messages that Norfolk has and the messages that Norfolk needs to share with the world. And so I'm going to share with you tonight some of the ideas that we have on studying cities and what makes cities special, and then Norfolk's opportunity to really tell its story, and then a new effort that we've put together called the collaboratory. It's even a new word, but it's short for collaboration, and for us all to collaborate on the messaging of Norfolk. And then I want to end with how you can really help us, how you can help us move this messaging initiative forward. So let's start by examining some trends, some really broad trends that are reshaping cities of the future. And when I say cities, I mean the entire metropolitan area. The first trend is there's really an explosion of population. If you look at the U.S. population, we're at 317 million Americans, and we're going to 358 million in the next 20 years. And where are all these people going? Well, they're going to cities. There's no question, when you look at the U.S. Census data, that we are really a bi-coastal country. The largest part of our population lives on each coast. And it's been growing that way for a long time. These blue dots on this slide show where the heaviest growth has occurred over the last 10 years. But over the last 100 years, this trend has been going on. We've been moving from the rural areas to the cities. And experts say this is going to continue in the future. And look where we are. We're already sort of in a population center. But our population is going to look very different in the future, very different. There's going to be a 
fundamental shift in age. And we call it the age shift. And this is about destiny, demographic destiny. Ever since the dawn of man, there have always been more younger people alive than older people. And if you studied sociology, you would remember the population pyramid. A lot of people, youth, a little fewer in old age. What is happening is this population pyramid is shifting. We've got a big shift that's happened in our birth rates. This is a slide that shows all the generations that are alive right now, from the greatest, the silent, boomers, Gen X, and Gen Y. And notice the relative size of these generations, how different they are. Well, it's because of birth rates and shifting birth rates. Back in the Depression, when the silent generation was just an idea of the greatest generation, the GI generation, during the 1930s, it was a hard time. And a lot of people didn't feel like making babies. And so there was a fundamental baby dearth. And then when the silent generation grew up and got into the baby making years, World War II uh, ended, and it was really an exciting time. In fact, a baby boom occurred. And then at the end of, uh, after this baby boom occurred, what happened is that a little white pill got invented, and we had two people working in the workforce. And so as boomers, we had another baby dearth. We had fewer Gen X kids. And someone in Washington said, let's turn on that immigration, and let's get more people to come into America. And so that Gen X population actually is a lot larger when you factor in immigration. And now we're just replacing ourselves in terms of the birth rates. So the shifting birth rates is a big part of this age shift. The second big part is something everyone in this room has benefited from, and that's the extended life expectancy. We really have seen an enormous improvement in healthcare and inoculations and fluoride. And so our life expectancy has gone from 47 to 80. Wow. So focusing on boomers and that big boom that happened, you can look at the population pyramid and see it fundamentally shape if you track boomers as they age. So I'm gonna start in 1981 and it's men on the left and women on the right and it shows the number of people alive at each age segment. And watch this population pyramid shift shapes into the future and by 2041 be a population rectangle. So when we think of that classic pyramid, we say maybe we should be thinking of sort of a classic rectangle, maybe the Empire State Building. And a lot of us are gonna reach the 89th floor. Well, this changes everything and everything for cities. In the future, there are gonna be relatively fewer younger people in the population and relatively more older people. And that has profound implications. I'll start with the older people first. Think about the boomer population replacing the seniors today. So you're gonna have 72 million replacing 38 million. Basically the doubling of the senior population. It's gonna happen all across America. And it's gonna happen right here in Norfolk. And you're saying, well, what, what's it gonna be like to have 20% of the population senior? Why is that a big deal? Well, what state do we make a little bit of fun of in terms of being senior? Florida. And today, Florida's 20% senior in terms of its total population makeup, and it's going to 30% senior in the future. Well, it's gonna be a different kind of senior in the future. It's gonna be aging baby boomers. And if you look at the word boomer, it has a special spelling. There's a me in boomers. Boomers tend to be a little more self-centric, a little more interested in being transformative. And the way they were wired in their wonder years has created sort of a mindset of wanting to come in and change things and make things, in boomers' eyes, better for boomers. And when we do our research among boomers, we see that most of them think they're gonna be living to 85 or 87. And the one thing that when we really push them, they won't deny is that things change as you get older. In case you were wondering where Barbie went, this is Barbie. And Barbie changes. The warranty really does run out as we get older. But one thing that boomers say is that even though I'm not gonna be able to see as well or hear as well, or maybe intersections are a little more confusing, nine out of 10 of them say, I'm still gonna live at home. I'm gonna live in my community. I'm not gonna go off to Sun City. Well, it's gonna be interesting. Because right now, if you count the cars on the road, about one in seven are driven by people 65 and older. In the future, it's gonna be one in four. So no wonder Google 
is coming out with a driverless car, right? And even thinking about the airbags on the outside of the car. But what it means for people that are in the city making business is we have to make our place, our city, a great place for the new wave of aging boomers. Because what we're seeing in our research across America is that more and more boomers are thinking about how do I age gracefully in place, in community? How can I find a 15 minute walkable community where I can get everything I need all right there in my own backyard, my own community? Well, let's look at the other side of this equation. There are gonna be relatively fewer younger people in the future because of this shift in that population pyramid. Fewer younger people as the population grows. And there's a name for these younger people, and the one that I want to use is millennials. Have you all heard of that term, millennials? This is the group that actually texts one another when they're standing next to each other. Well, millennials are ushering in a new way of thinking about community. In fact, I call it hyper-community. These guys are hyper-connectors. Think about all of the advances in technology that they've enjoyed and really have taught us how to use, connecting on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. They're also hyper collaborators. Think about how schools are designed now. Every project's a group project. And they're hyper sharers. They're ushering in a new form of our economy, sort of the collaborative consumption or sharing economy. Owning an asset is sort of a relic of the past. The future is about sharing assets and creating a sharing economy. So in a lot of the cities, we're already seeing entire fleets of bicycles that people rent and even cars that people are renting. In fact, millennials, sometimes they're called Gen Ys, they're much less car-centric than folks that are in the Gen X population or in the boomer population. This chart shows the number of people who got their driver's license at age 16 back when I got out of high school in 1978. And I remember that day, boy, right when you turn 16, you want to get the car, right? Get your driver's license. Well, that was then. Today, it's only 31% of people 16. And by the time you're 18, it used to be nine out of 10 of people back in 1978 got their driver's license. Today, uh, it's 68%. Well, it's also causing some havoc for Japan, for Toyota, and for Detroit, because they're seeing a decrease in the number of cars being purchased by younger people. And if you go to towns and big cities across America, you're starting to see enormous gains in bike trails and bikeability. And even in skateboardability in Portland, you see these signs up all around telling you this is a skateboard route. Well, it's not about being anti-car. It's not about getting rid of the car for young people. What it's really about for them is, is ushering in a new sense of community. It's really about being more environmentally conscious, more socially aware, more local, and more creative. That's what they really want to see in communities. And so to keep young people in a community or to get them to come back after college, communities have to be focused on the same sort of idea that new seniors are gonna want, this 15-minute walkable community. 15-minute walkable community. Well, there's another sort of longer-term issue about this population shift that has economic development agencies scratching their heads. How are we gonna deal with this? There is a coming job shortage. It sounds ridiculous to say, sort of on the tail end of this great recession, but if you look at the numbers, if you look at the demography, the age band that really makes up the majority of the workers in America, 20 to 54, are gonna see an increase of 12 million over the next 15 years. The older population is where all the growth's gonna take place. The 55 plus segment's gonna grow by 25 million. It used to be exactly opposite, but because of the boomers, because of that pig and the python and the way you saw that go through time out into the future, they're gonna be relatively fewer younger people. And they're gonna to gravitate to cities that they feel really welcome them and let them do the things they wanna do. So in the future, there are gonna be some cities that win and there are gonna be some cities that lose. And this word is already getting out. There are books out about it, uh, we're one of the folks that write about it. Uh, the coming job wars, the shock of gray, just the whole idea of this demographic destiny. And so what experts have been saying, and I think now more and more cities get, is we've got to make our community a great place for millennials too. We have to make it a great place for millennials. And cities are now preparing the way. 
they really have embraced sort of a new economic development equation, a new way of thinking about how do we grow our community. And we coin it as a place-making shift that's taken place. The old model is economic development. People would go out and advertise and go knock on doors of big companies and say, please move your entire company to our city. And all these workers would come, and that's how we would grow. Well, that's the old model. The new model is you build a sense of place, a sense of community, and it's so great that people come to it, that people stay in the community when they retire, and that young people come back to it when they get out of college, and that businesses grow from within organically, and then others come because so many people are talking about how great your city is. And this model's already starting to emerge in cities like Portland, in Denver, and even Austin. In fact, we've done a lot of research on these cities and others around the country, and we've explored all these different attributes that make up a city from the variety of employment options, to safety, to uh, innovation, having a rich history, offering an active art scene, uh, supporting entrepreneurs. And these, this chart shows scores on all of these different attributes across each one of these cities. And I want to point out to you how Austin scores so high across so many of these attributes. And this survey was done among young professionals. And what shocked us the most were not Austin's scores, but what happens when you have such high scores. When you have high scores, people are actually in love with their city, and they're showing it through those high ratings. There's a new way of measuring how satisfied people are with different goods and services or different experiences, like going to a shopping mall. It's called a net promoter score. And the net promoter score looks at a rating on zero to 10, with 10 being the highest. And it takes only the people that give a 10 or a nine, and it subtracts all the other people that gave a zero to six, and it comes up with a net score. And it's called a net promoter score. And you can Google it. Every company has a net promoter score, just about every organization now. Well, loving your city, really matters, because when we look at the net promoter score for Austin, and we compare it to all the other cities, Austin is two times as strong as any other city. Two times. And you see those individual scores and those attributes, and now you know why. So the real goal is to try to help people understand just how great they have it, and how much they really do love their city. And to help a city become ageless, which means it's great for people of all ages, and so I want to share with you how cities are doing that. Ten traits of winning cities that we see all across the country. The first one is that everybody owns the brand. Everybody owns what the city's brand is. This is one of my favorite stops when I see my daughter in Memphis. She goes to Rhodes College, and it's called Sun Studio. And it's kind of sort of the home of rock and roll, where a lot of the early recordings took place of some very famous musicians. When you go there, you meet this guy, Biff, who works behind the counter, and he's got a tattoo of Sun City on his chest. And when I saw Biff for the first time, I went up to him and I thought for sure he owned this establishment, right? And I said, boy, what is that on your chest? Could you share it with me? And he pulled his shirt down and really proudly displayed that tattoo of the whole business. And I said, so you own this place? And he said, no, I work here. I'm so proud of it that I wear it like this. Well, a lot of us are proud of some of the places that we call home or second home, like OBX. How many stickers do you see around here with Outer Banks on the back of a car? And now we're seeing this happen all around the country where people in different communities are doing these open block lettering and allowing you to fill in kind of how you see your city. It's happening in Richmond big time. Richmond's been renamed sort of RVA, not by any one organization, but by the whole community. And people are filling in their view and their vision and their love for Richmond. And that is being expressed in so many different ways by so many people, viral videos that are getting being made about being happy and loving RVA. So how are we doing here in Norfolk with that idea of everyone owning the brand? Well, I will tell you, I think you guys invented this idea. Because when I look around this community, I start to see pictorial essays on what it's like to live here on all these mermaids. And I see so many executions of all these mermaids. Everybody is sort of saying, this is my version of Norfolk. 
And now people even playing with abbreviations of Norfolk, with, with NFK and giving it a little mermaid spin of its own. But owning your own brand, not having a brand being handed down on high, but having a brand being expressed by everybody who makes up a community is the first thing we're seeing of winning communities. The second one is being really creative and entrepreneurial. Boy, city after city is focused on entrepreneurs now and growing businesses from within and really appealing to millennials and their drive for being creative. It used to be that business incubators were just a rough concept 30 years ago, but today there are over 1,200 of these all across the country. In last count, almost 50,000 businesses got generated by these incubators. And so how are you guys doing? Well, there's one right here downtown called Hatch. And if you quickly Google it, you can see all of its success stories and what's happening. ODU is getting ready to open up a big incubator called the Business Gateway. And I hope part of it goes beyond ODU's boundaries. But recognition for being an entrepreneur is really what it's really what you can take home because you can merchandise it to so many other people. In Entrepreneur Magazine, sort of the definitive magazine on entrepreneurship, named best cities for entrepreneurs, Norfolk. You got it, Norfolk, Virginia. And everybody I talk to about this, hardly anyone realizes Norfolk's recognized by this preeminent magazine in this category. Well, number three winning trait, being funky and authentic. Funky and authentic. So I talked to you about Austin and how well it's doing and its net promoter score. Well, if you look under the covers in Austin, it's kind of weird. In fact, that's what they say. Keep Austin weird. And that's their ad campaign. And everywhere you look, you see weirdness. And they flaunt it. And they celebrate it. And it's really a lot of fun to go there, but also to talk to people from there because they're just telling you how crazy it is. Well, it's not only Austin. Portland is all about being weird. In fact, they have the same campaign. Keep Portland weird. Portland expresses a lot of different ways. But the biggest thing for me when I go to Portland is to understand the tolerance level that Portland has for anything and everything that's weird. They just celebrate it. In fact, when I was there, something kind of weird happened to me. So luckily, it got captured on film so I could share it with you. Now that gentleman's name, if I can use that term, is Monkey Man. Woo! And he's actually part of the brand of Portland. The point is, people didn't stop and yell at him, they celebrated him. Because it was part of making a special place that is Portland. And now we're seeing all across America people expressing their creativities in cities, creating their sense of place and making it unique, putting up murals and such. So how's Norfolk doing? Well, I think Norfolk was one of the early adopters to this. Uh, this. This scene went up a long time ago. But if you go back to the mermaids, in marketing, to have a brand and to have an icon that stands for the brand and sort of an expression of it, like your mermaids, is amazing. And cities would die for that, to really have something like that. Well, you used to express it a lot. And you see a lot of the mermaids around town. And people have come up to me on this project and said, well, don't you think we should get rid of the mermaid? I think we should celebrate the mermaid. The mermaid is so unique and is so definitively Norfolk that letting different expressions of it take place, kind of in a 21st century expression of it, and let it take place in different places and let people really have their imagination go wild, I think would say we're really creative and we're really tolerant and we're really expressive. And maybe there's certain locations that are better than others but really letting a city in neighborhoods even express, express their unique characteristics by doing fun things. And so as everybody debates this art district and we watch it unfold, boy, it's the perfect place to celebrate different expressions and maybe different expressions of our mermaid. Number four, sustainability. Wow, cities are really hyper-focused on this and demonstrating this in so many different public ways. Uh, in Portland, you can't tell where a street starts and a park starts. And in the future, we're going to see so much more echo farming everywhere. In fact, we're already starting to see community gardens everywhere. 
So how's Norfolk doing on this? Well, just this past year, city ordinances allow chickens now, chickens in neighborhoods. In Five Points Farm Market, I don't know if you've been there, but I have, it's tremendous. And it's all local produce. And then, if you like produce, sometimes it goes well with beer. And in Smart Mouth and O'Connor's, homegrown breweries here right in town. Collaborative spaces is another winning trait that we see of cities that are making their places really special, doing a great job with placemaking. Being really open for collaboration, open in terms of inviting so everybody can sit in and feel like it's public space is happening. And we're seeing that happen right here in Norfolk as well. Uh, downtown, there's this park that was put together called The Plot. Uh, the Croc Community Center, fantastic, just opened up recently. The Slover Memorial Library is going to be a community resource center, incredible high-tech facility that's slated to open up very soon. So Norfolk understands this concept. Number six, food and music everywhere. Food and music everywhere. The food truck phenomena is happening in a big way, and it's really being fueled by millennials. The studies that we do on millennials and cities, food is their new way of stepping back from technology for a minute and interfacing with one another. It's their new sort of currency. And they spend a lot of their times congregating around food trucks. And now, just for convenience sake, they're even mobile food trucks, which are mobile beer wagons. And we're seeing these in different cities. I just saw one recently in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. But you just can't sit and drink. You have to do some pedaling here as well but you pedal it all throughout an, an area, uh, and it comes with a designated driver. So how's Norfolk doing in this area? Well, Norfolk's just gotten started with food trucks, and it always takes a while to get things on, on the road, so to speak. So I feel like it's off to a good start. In terms of music, Norfolk is really off to a running start. All of the fest events activities, they really are millennial magnets. 50% of the attendees go to those fest events. And when they go, they're pretty happy. 82% overall of all attendees give fest events a great high rating. Uh, and 79% leave with a really great impression of downtown. And when they come here, they also leave something behind. They, most of them are spending money on different attractions, not only the event itself, but also on things to do nearby. Well, when it comes to music, like all, a lot of these other sort of attributes or dimensions of great cities that are sort of winning and establishing a great sense of place, having a third party recognize it is often helpful. And in this case, the Rolling Stone magazine, which arguably is the definitive voice on rock and roll, came out and said the number one venue for small music acts in America is the Norva here in Norfolk. Number one facility. Unbelievable. Affordable housing. Well, this isn't a great story in terms of the need for it, because we really have gone through a lost decade. A lot of the folks that have graduated from college and, and some that didn't go to college have experienced an enormous setback with this great recession. In fact, it used to be that the older people in society, because they lived for a while, had about tenfold more assets than younger people under 35. And this wealth gap has now expanded to 47 times. It's just enormous. And so what's happening for a lot of young people are the move to these micro apartments where they're not much more space than a kitchen and a pull-out bed. But we're seeing those in every city. Every major city is having these. It's the idea of living smaller and letting your life really revolve around what's outside and apartment buildings having community space for a lot of people. Well, how is Norfolk doing with affordable housing? Well, pretty good. Broad Creek is a uh, really uh, redeveloped area of Roberts Village in, in Bowling Green Public Housing, and it's gotten some awards and a lot of recognition. Southwind's apartment, these units are rent and income restricted, and uh, sort of a new facility that's gone up. Meadowwood Apartments, relatively new. This was 80% um, market rate rents and 20% 20, 20 affordable housing uh, units set aside. And then West Church, which is um, sort of a new development, but this is also with various incomes and qualifications for mortgages, really helping out here. So I could go on and on in this category, and a lot of work still needs to be done, but Norfolk is, is moving in this direction. 
Business everywhere is another trend of winning cities. And this is really being fueled by technology, but also by a generation we haven't talked about, the Gen Xers. And these guys are hyper-wired to be sort of independent and task-driven. Really, they are the latchkey kids when they were growing up. And so when we think about what they are looking for in business is just to really get the job done on time and on budget. And they really value a freelance sort of operator status. They just really want to be focused on, on getting it done. They're not as interested in managing sort of the outputs in terms of like timesheets. They're more interested in managing the outcomes. And so consequently, these guys are going to allow teleworking to happen more, and we're going to see a diminished uh, square foot of office space per worker. In fact, it's going to fall precipitously, and some experts are saying uh, it's going to get to under 100 square feet per worker when it was over 200 square feet in the past. And we're seeing it in offices, this open space, open architecture. And maybe it's going to get even lower than that from some expert accounts. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we really are becoming sort of entrepreneurs, Inc. are us, where businesses can operate anywhere and everywhere. And that's what's happening in Norfolk. Thriving businesses in every neighborhood. And so the 35th Street Better Block's a great example. This was a charrette put on to see how could we bring this neighborhood back to life. And for two days, uh, sort of decorated businesses and, and put um, tables and chairs and blocked off some of the streets. And, and this ended up getting the evidence needed to put a plan together that's now being used to recruit uh, restaurants and businesses. And so the first step has taken place, and now we'll watch this unfold. Number nine is mixed use, is what we're seeing across the country. And the best lesson here is from Portland, Oregon, the rule of one third. In Oregon, in Portland, when you build in the downtown area or the most concentrated area, one third of the building has to be retail, one third commercial, and one third residential. So they're building in community, so you don't need to walk very far. And in Norfolk, probably the best example is the Wells Fargo building, or maybe uh, the uh, at Old Dominion University, the University Apartments, with retail on the bottom and then living space above. And the last point, number 10, is really healthcare everywhere. Because of the aging boomers wanting to live in place, there's going to be healthcare everywhere. You're not going to have to get in your car to go and connect yourself to all the doctors you're going to need to see to manage chronic conditions. And in Norfolk, we're really blessed with this great institution, EVMS. Uh, and, and sort of its mission and stated mission to be the most community-oriented school in medicine and health professions in the U.S. So when you put all of this together, all 10 of these sort of trends that we see winning cities practicing, they really all come back to this concept of how do you build it all into your neighborhood to a 15-minute walkable community? And that's what we're seeing the beginnings of in a lot of neighborhoods around Norfolk, certainly the redevelopment of Ward's Corner and I remember my, my mother-in-law taking me there and talking about it when it was the Times Square of the South. But also when you think about what's going on in um, Ocean View and, wow, just to go up to East Beach. I mean, everybody in Norfolk needs to ride up there and just see what has happened and the developments taking place. But while this is perhaps the newest neighborhood, if you go to one of the oldest, something remarkable just took place. In West Freemason, it was just awarded by the American Planning Association. And this is, these are the people that plan neighborhoods, that go to graduate school to have degrees to plan the best way to build neighborhoods. They named as an association, a national association, West Freemason to be one of the 10 best neighborhoods in the country. Wow. Okay, John, what does all this have to do with the future of Norfolk? Well, all of this is the future of Norfolk. And Norfolk is just right on track in building a great sense of place. And we have a special opportunity right now to really tell our story. Because all these things are gonna pick up in pace. And we're seeing it with the reintroduction of Waterside, Waterside 2.0. And if you listen carefully and look carefully, a number of developments, placemaking activities and real estate developments are coming online. And here's the wonderful opportunity. They're all happening at the same time. So there's a critical mass that's about to come online. And as they all come online, it's a great opportunity to tell our story about the entire city of Norfolk.
to really share with the world the why behind all of this. What is all of this happening for? What is our raison d'etre? What is our reason for being? What is our story? And how do we tell the news in a way that tells the world we have something really special here? And so that's the role of the collaboratory, this massive collective that we've created. And what we want to do with this, the mission, is to really create consensus-driven messaging that everybody contributes to, that we can then all use to advance the city of Norfolk, that we can all share when we're talking to our friends, or if we happen to be a marketing director of an organization that we include in the statements and in the messaging and in the designs and ads that we send out. Now, I'm a fan of children's books. Do you guys remember Horton Hears a Who? Right? Well, I love this book. I love Horton. But most of all, I love the message. Because Horton had a big problem. He had big ears. And he could hear all those little guys on that dust ball screaming, saying, we're alive, Horton. And none of Horton's friends could hear as well as Horton. And they thought Horton was crazy. And so they chased after that little dust ball. They wanted to, to, to drop it into, I think, bezel nut stew. Well, Horton didn't know anything about this. He wanted to protect those people on that dust ball, the people of Whoville. And he kept saying, and, please yell louder and louder. Let my friends hear you. And so all those little people of Whoville were screaming louder and louder, every single one of them. And it just wasn't quite loud enough. And Horton said, please, please, as loud as you can, one last effort. And then the mayor discovered that little Cindy Who that wasn't doing anything in, in the Lord Fairfax apartment and grabbed her and put her on top of his shoulders with a megaphone, and she was the last voice with the whole community singing and screaming that made it possible for all those other animals to hear Horton wasn't crazy. There were people of Whoville. And so that's the great metaphor, to have this unified message that everyone can hear. And so what's our message? Well, we created a straw man messaging for you to look at to give everybody a head start. And the way we did it was to have three pieces of input, our experience in doing travel and economic development marketing, looking at relevant studies that Norfolk has, it has performed in the past, and then interviewing a cross-section of, of Norfolk leaders and emerging leaders. And I want to take you through just some highlights from that and then get to the messaging. In terms of our experience, we know that a great message has to be important to the people that are hearing it. It's got to be believable. You have to have support for it. You just can't make it up. And then it's got to differentiate you, whether you're a product or service or a city. It should be based on research. And the studies that we looked at from Norfolk, Visit Norfolk Fest events, the Downtown Norfolk Council, and the Greater Norfolk Corporation um, were, were numerous. The one that I want to share with you tonight came from the Greater Norfolk Corporation. It was called a brain gain study. And it asked people in the area to say, what's your most favorite aspect of this region? And number one, across every age group, under 30, 31 to 40, over 41, water. Number two, fun. And number three, diversity. That's what people said were the top three most favorite aspects of living here. And then interviewing a cross-section of people, we said, what defines the city of Norfolk? What do you guys think really makes Norfolk special? And we heard 10 things. And here they are. 10 things. Number one, unique location, Virginia's coastal region. History, a legacy of resiliency and transformation. That's Norfolk. And just think of all the programs the city has to help neighborhoods rebuild themselves, the block-by-block -block grants being one. Physical features, the water and the international port. Personality, vibrant, alive, forward-looking. Assets, diverse neighborhoods, economy, entertainment, culture, worldwide connections the military and trade. Number six, gravity, sort of the heartbeat of the region's culture and business, right? Inclusionary, increasingly people of all ages, races, and generations are valued. Special appeal, attractive to visitors, doers, and makers. Demographic appeal, great place to raise a family. And then this idea of immediacy that Wow, it seems like more and more people are really making a difference now that Norfolk really is transforming itself. So when we put all of these things that we heard into a big pot and started around and looked at the findings from the study and looked at the sort of the new model on economic development, we saw three themes that make up the messaging for Norfolk that have to support it. The first one is, my gosh, water everywhere. 
Few urban cities have water like we do. And then hyper-community, it seems like more and more people care and are rolling up their sleeves and making a difference. And then number three, we're a community of doers. Come here and you can make a difference. You can pursue your own dreams. So all of those go into crafting our brand message architecture. And the best way to describe that ar message architecture is to really think about a positioning statement. What would you say to somebody on an elevator in another town about your city, about Norfolk? How do you want that person, that audience, to know and understand the Norfolk brand? What's that one sentence you want them to take away? And so here's our proposed straw man idea. The city of Norfolk is America's vibrant heritage port city where people of all backgrounds and ages are actively transforming their neighborhoods, economy, and culture into the most fun and livable waterfront community in the world. Well, words matter. So I'm gonna tell you some of the logic here on these words. In terms of city of Norfolk, we want to define this place not as downtown, not as East Beach Beach, not as Ocean View, not as Ward's Corner, but as the city of Norfolk, made up of all of Norfolk's neighborhoods. Number two, it's America's asset. So let's put it on a national stage. Number three, let's reinforce vibrant. Norfolk's a vibrant community. The idea of a heritage port city is to give us a little running advantage over other port cities. There is something that my mother-in-law taught me, uh, Sarah Greer, about World Heritage Sites. This is a, a designation that's put out by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And so the UN has said there's some special places all over our planet that should really be preserved. And they're designated as World Heritage Sites, things like the China Wall. But you have to take care of those. The World Heritage Site is such a, a distinguished designation, it means a lot of people are going to come see you. So why not borrow that and really call our port part of a heritage port city? It immediately eliminates a lot of other ports, like perhaps San Diego. But it puts us in elite group with New York and Philadelphia and maybe Savannah. City of Norfolk includes everyone, people of all backgrounds and all ages. This idea of actively transforming as part of our message architecture is so critical because it's really the DNA that people described about this place. And for those of you that have been here a long time, boy, have you seen this place transform. It has really taken shape, new shapes over, over the years. So I think about Norfolk as a verb, as a legacy of transformation. And that's something that I don't think will go away. And what are we transforming? Neighborhoods, economy, and culture. And we're doing it in a way that's taking us into a place where we're going to be the most fun because people want to have fun. People aspire to have fun. And visitors who we want to come here to have fun and hang out. And livable, because we're about quality of life, about making a place wonderful to live. And then again, you can't forget water because that's what the differentiator is of Norfolk, our waterfront. In community, we all want to be community. And why not be the best waterfront community in the world? Aspirationally, why not say, that's what we're about. We're on the journey to get to this spot. I don't know if you'll ever arrive, but you certainly can aspire towards something this ambitious. We call it a BHAG, which is a big, hairy, audacious gold, which is what Jim Collins talks about in a lot of his books about what you have to aspire to, something that is really uh, romantic and something that can pull you along. So the promise statement is Norfolk is a place where you can easily make your own, and you fill in the blank, happen in the most fun, livable, waterfront community in the world. There's a lot more to this positioning statement, and it starts with your help. We all love Norfolk. And we are all, I think, now are fans of Horton Hears a Who. We understand getting that message out there. So what has happened is we've created, we've been part of a group to create this Norfolk Collaboratory. And this is the website for it. It's NorfolkCollaboratory.com. And if you go there, you'll learn in more detail about this whole messaging architecture. And what we want you to do is to go there and understand in great detail 
what this is about, but help us refine that positioning statement and promise statement and others. Literally go to this website and, we, and click on the home page on this graphic on the left, which is a brochure that'll take you through all of the things that are happening right now in terms of making a better place in Norfolk and all the real estate developments that are coming online. And, it, and it'll just take you 10 minutes to look through that. You could do it in five minutes, but it'll give you a, even a better sense of the things that are happening right now. And remarkably, things that are happening that will become online all at the same time, all within a year of each other, which presents this incredible opportunity for this city. Secondly, after you've kind of gotten a little knowledge on the exact things that are happening, go to the second step and look at this document it's a PowerPoint document that takes you through that straw man positioning. So you really understand what we're talking about. And with that, a command of that, go to the third step and take a survey. And I guarantee you it's a short survey, but it's a, sure, a survey where you can provide feedback on that straw man idea, where you can say, you know, I like this word or I like this phrase or you left this out. We need your input. So we want you to look at this brochure, Look at this short PowerPoint and really understand the messaging, and then take this short survey. And then together, we're gonna to refine this brand architecture. And we're gonna come up with something that everybody can feel that they have been part of and have been part of. And where this is headed is we really wanna make this actionable. Norfolk's message needs to be easy so it understands and easy to incorporate in everyone's communication messaging. And let me give you an example of how it's already starting by just the four, P four organizations who've been involved in this. Uh, Visit Norfolk is really enamored with this idea of the heritage port city and is exploring ways to put that into its marketing efforts. Fest events, which throws the wonderful events in Norfolk. This idea of the most fun and livable waterfront community in the world. Well, Fest events is thinking about a new sport for Norfolk. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But they are thinking about having more and more of these uh, waterfront um, activities, including these fun balls that you can play in. And Fest Events has just put together a new ad that it's going to run in some programs. And the body copy of the ad already is using this line, the most fun and livable waterfront community in the world. So think about if every organization coming online, and we're going to meet with all of them, starts to use this sort of direction, this sort of messaging, so it can have a unified voice about what Norfolk's about and what Norfolk's becoming. The why behind all of these exciting projects that are happening all across Norfolk's neighborhoods. And we wanna make this inclusionary. We need your participation and your support. And so we want every neighborhood to be represented. We want every organization and associations. We want big and small businesses. We would like to have hundreds of people take that survey and really weigh in so we can make this our message, so we really can make this our movement. When we first started this, I uh, had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with the mayor, and I remember in that interview asking him, what, what, where are we gonna go with this? Where are you headed with Norfolk? And what he said was, I wanna see Norfolk to be a place where our children want to live. Where do we want our children to live? Right here. If they go off to school, we want them to come back. Well, guess what? It's happening. It's already happening. This is an article that just came out in USA Today just two days ago. And the article is entitled Millennial Magnets. And it's a study done of all cities across America, over 100,000. And what it looked at were how many people in the age group of 20 to 29, so sort of after college, if you will, how many people are in that city compared to the teenagers in that city, people who are 10 to 20? So saying, are you getting people to come back? And when you look at this list, and I'm saying a national list with cities with 10,000 or more, so the hundreds of cities, Norfolk is number 13. Number 13. And what's even more remarkable is when you look closely at the list and see who we're above. Seattle, number one, but then there's Norfolk. We're ahead of Richmond, head of Portland, head of that hot city, Austin, with that net promoter score, head of Denver, head of a place called Virginia Beach. 
The U.S. average is 103, and Norfolk's at the top of the list, 13 nationally. So what this is all about is building a great place for people of every age and building a great place that our kids are going to call home and make into the best waterfront community in the world. Thank you.